Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here today and joining us at the Department of Justice. As you know, President Trump and the, his entire administration are committed to supporting the incredibly brave men and women of law enforcement who protect our communities and keep our citizens safe all across the country. We're especially reminded of their heroism and sacrifices at this time during National Police Week when we honor those who put their lives at risk, lives on the line and at risk every day of the year for all of their fellow citizens. In February, the President issued an executive order aimed at preventing violence against federal, state, tribal, and local law enforcement officers. Through that order, the Attorney General has directed the Department of Justice to develop strategies to support the thousands of law enforcement agencies across the country as they seek to prevent crime and safeguard the public. I'm pleased to stand before you here today, along with Chairman Pai of the Federal Communications Commission and Acting Director Homan from the Immigration and Customs Enforcement to announce the launch of the latest tool in our effort to protect law enforcement from violent attacks, the nationwide rollout of the National Blue Alert Network. Named in honor of two fallen New York City Police Department officers who were horrifically ambushed in December 2014, the Rafael Ramos and Wenjian Liu National Blue Alert Act was enacted to establish a nationwide Blue Alert communications network. Blue Alerts provide for rapid dissemination of information to law enforcement, the media, and public about violent offenders who have killed, seriously injured, or pose an imminent threat to law enforcement. Blue Alerts can also be issued to help locate an officer who is missing in connection with official duties. Blue Alerts are operationally similar to Amber Alerts and can be broadcast on television, radio, and sent to cell phones and other wireless devices. And like Amber Alerts, which are designed to speed information about missing children to the public, Blue Alerts provide details about possible assailants, including physical descriptions, vehicle information, and other identifying characteristics, information that law enforcement uses to keep the public safe and that can be used to support their own safety as well. I would like to thank the Department's Office of Community-Oriented Policing Services, also known as the COPS Office, for its tremendous work in implementing the Blue Alert Act and managing the National Blue Alert Network. The COPS Office has not only worked with the FCC and DHS on the technological aspects of the Blue Alert Network, but has also created an extensive, secure online repository for law enforcement of many Blue Alert Network resources collected from around the nation, and these include the legislation, guidance documents, policies, standard operating procedures, and much more. I would also like to express the Department's gratitude to the members of the Blue Alert Network, uh, Blue Alert Advisory Group, highly motivated law enforcement stakeholders who worked closely with the Department throughout the Blue Alert Network development process, and many of them are here with us today on stage. And finally, I would like to acknowledge Acting Deputy Administrator David Grant from the Federal Emergency Management Agency for all of the effort that FEMA has put into supporting the Blue Alert Network, as well as the ATF, the FBI, the DEA, and the U.S. Marshals Service for joining us here today and lending their partnership to these efforts. Far too many ambush-style attacks on law enforcement have affected our communities and put officers at risk. Those persons who would kill or seriously harm law enforcement officers in the line of duty pose an inherently elevated and unique danger to all of us. And any delay in capture could result in the death of other law enforcement officers and nearby innocent civilians. Blue Alert, Blue Alert provides an important framework for quick response, and the National Blue Alert Network will no doubt aid in protecting the lives of the man, men and women who bravely and nobly serve in our law enforcement communities throughout the country. I thank you all for being here, and it is my pleasure to introduce the chairman of the FCC, Chairman Pai. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, my thanks to the Acting Associate General for the kind introduction and for hosting us here today for this important event. Uh, thanks as well to the members of the Blue Alert Advisory Group and to all of the law enforcement officers and members of the community who are here today. During Police Week, we pay tribute to the men and women in uniform who put themselves at risk every day to keep us safe. And today, 
The FCC is grateful for the chance to honor our friends in blue with action, not just words. Let me take a moment to describe that action. Many of you may recall watching television or listening to the radio when the programming is disrupted by an alert about an impending risk, usually extreme weather. Now, these alerts are delivered through what is called the Emergency Alert System, or EAS. The EAS uses different codes to identify what type of alert is being sent to the public, an amber alert or a flash flood, for instance. Uh, the FCC authorizes these codes to be used in connection with the EAS. But there's a gap. There is no EAS code addressing an imminent threat against law enforcement. We are aiming to change that. I'm pleased to announce that yesterday I formally proposed to my colleagues at the Federal Communications Commission that we authorize a new Blue Alert EAS alert code. As General Panuccio just explained, Blue Alerts are an important tool to notify the public about imminent threats against law enforcement and to help apprehend dangerous suspects. My proposal would give state and local authorities that option to use a dedicated alert code to send these warnings to the public over broadcast, cable, satellite, and wireline video networks. My fellow commissioners will vote on this proposal at our next monthly meeting on June 22, 2017. If it's approved, we will then seek public input on whether the EAS is the right way to deliver blue alerts. We'll also explore whether a dedicated EAS code can enable the uniform nationwide delivery of blue alerts to the public, as envisioned by the Blue Alert Act. We will also ask whether blue alerts could be delivered through the complementary but separate wireless emergency alert system, which delivers critical warnings and information to your mobile phones. Now we know that some states have their own blue alert programs that use various methods to issue warnings. Our hope is that our rules will spur and support the development of a coordinated and nationwide framework that states can adopt with ease. Now with this step, we don't just advance a policy we affirm a principle, that we have a collective responsibility to protect and serve those who protect and serve us. We take that responsibility very seriously at the FCC. The proposal to establish Blue Alerts is just one example of our commitment to it. Among other things, the FCC also has unanimously adopted reforms that will make it easier for correctional facilities to detect and block the use of contraband phones. And we are also playing an important role in the creation of a nationwide interoperable public safety broadband network, an initiative now known as FirstNet. On these matters and more, rest assured that we will always be there for the men and women in blue as long as I have the honor of serving as chairman of the FCC and as long as we have the terrific, dedicated career staff at the FCC, some of whom who are here today. With that, it is my privilege to introduce the acting director of U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, Mr. Tom Homan, who is representing as well the Department of Homeland Security and FEMA. Thank you, sir. Okay, I'm not as young as these other two guys, so I gotta use my glasses, I apologize. First of all, I wanna say I'm pleased to be here today to pledge ICE's support and DHS's support and commitment to the important life-saving tool. I would like to thank Attorney General Sessions for his leadership in launching the National Blue Alert Network and FCC Chairman Pai for establishing a regulatory framework that enables it to work. I also want to thank the men behind me, the architects of this program, the ones who built the program. Thank you very much for all your work. I've been in law enforcement for more than 33 years and one thing you never get used to is losing a fellow officer. It's a nightmare for all the families that live every day until a law enforcement officer returns home safe. In fact, one week ago was National Police Week here in D.C., and I joined the families of two of my fallen officers, Officer Beliso and Scott McGuire, in a tribute to honor the loss of those two brave men and to thank them for their courage and their sacrifice and also for the courage and sacrifice of the families that no longer have them. It's impossible to measure the impact on our communities when an officer, agent, or investigator is killed in line of duty. It is especially disturbing when our brothers and sisters in uniform are targeted simply because they chose to serve and protect, to make all of us safer and more secure. By quickly communicating that an officer is missing or that there is an intimate and credible threat to kill or seriously injure a law enforcement officer, this new alert system may provide that extra minute's notice we need to catch the, guy, the bad guy. 
If this new system helps bring just one officer safely home, or prevents one more name to be added to that wall down the street, then it's worth it. Something is not in my notes from a personal perspective. As I said, I've been in law enforcement 33 years. I supervise the staff over 20,000, most of them law enforcement officers. I've carried a badge and gun for 33 years. I know it's like to be on the street. I know how dangerous of a job it is to be a street cop. Today's long past due. It's a good day for law enforcement. It's even a better day for the American communities, and I'm proud to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman, Director. Appreciate those uh, great remarks on this important day for law enforcement. We're happy to take some questions for a few minutes, uh, if there are any. Yes. Uh, well, I'm going to def uh, refer some of the questions about how the system will operate and, and what would uh, trigger the system to uh, the Deputy National Coordinator, Vince Davenport, who I think can answer some of those questions. Thanks, Laura. Thanks. So an imminent and credible threat is really a fact-based um, decision, and it's determined based on whether or not there is probable cause to believe that a crime has occurred. Uh, and that that threat fits into the elements of that crime. So in order for a blue alert to be issued uh, associated with a, a credible threat, the person who made the threat would have to have, would have to be wanted. There would have to be a warrant for his or her arrest in association with the threat. Other questions? Yes. I have one for ICE Director Thompson. Sure. There was some news today that um, and from the Detroit News that ICE is still using Stingray operations in order to um, track undocumented immigrants that would be using cell phone signals. Uh, I know in 2015 there was federal guidance not to use that uh, without a warrant anymore. Is this something ICE is still conducting and um, are you outside of that rule uh, that would require you to have a warrant? I'm not going to discuss law enforcement techniques at this press conference. Okay. If you want to reach out to our PAO, we can set something off. Okay, thank, okay. You. thank you. Other questions? Okay. With the states that are already setting up their own system, how does work, this work with them? Are you giving nationwide guidelines all states have to follow? Does this mean every state needs to now have a local system? How does this all sort of work together? Right. Good question. Vince? Sir, that is a very good question. So at present, there are 27 states that have blue alert plans. And really kind of the impetus behind the National Blue Alert Act was to bring some uniformity and some consistency to how these plans operate so that they all would share common guidelines, a common framework, common triggering criteria uh, to actually issue the blue alerts. And so what we have done to, up to this point is we've been in communication with all 27 states that have blue alert plans. And we've, they've shared with us their plans. We've had discussions about the rationales behind their plans. And we've made it known to them that through the National Blue Alert Network, we're here to offer uh, recommendations, voluntary recommendations and guidelines that we think are critical for states to adopt. And, and again, it's not mandatory, but what we're trying to do is we are making the case state by state, municipality by municipality, county by county, that it does, consistency does matter and that uniformity does matter because it's not uh, easy. Uh, I mean, there are many scenarios where suspects flee from one jurisdiction to the other. And this is where inconsistencies in state plans really create gaps in the overall pursuit of criminals. So we are working with those 27 states and we're excited about working with the other states, territories, and tribes to uh, help them develop their own blue alert plans that will fit into a national framework. If there are no others, we'll just uh, thank you all for coming out and covering this today. And again, thank you to all of the partners who helped make this important day for law enforcement happen. Uh, we're very pleased here at the department. I know all of our partners are, too, that we have another way to support and protect our law enforcement all across the country. Thank you very much.